Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Bruce Milligan. I'm the uh, CEO of the Spinal Injuries Association. This, I think, is day nine for me in that role, so you have to promise to be gentle with me. Um, I'm obviously on a, a steep learning curve and uh, getting to know staff and members and clients, uh, but also getting to know the, um, the detail of the work that the Spinal Injuries Association does. And uh, good morning to all the people in Townsville who've joined us as well. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge David Riley, who's uh, chair of the board of uh, the association, and also Alan Ashford, uh, one of our board directors, is here uh, as well. And um, also welcome to uh, uh, Professor Mackay Sim and Dr Muncie, um, and also to um, uh, Dr William Stephanie, who, uh, who just introduced some of the housekeeping. And welcome to all of you. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in this subject. I think we're... Uh, at capacity in terms of the room with, uh, with about 80 people who've um, come along this morning. Um, Hope, Hype and Progress, a forum about stem cell research. Um, I'd encourage you to uh, ask all sorts of questions and treat it as an interactive forum, as, uh, as Stephanie said, in terms of um, learning as much as you can about what's happening with stem cell research uh, and the clinical trials that are happening across the world. Um, obviously, one of our aims as an association is to provide information to our members and clients, and we have an information service uh, that's a one-stop shop when it comes to providing information that's relevant to assist our members and clients, everything from accessibility tourism to today's topic about stem cell research. Um, we're also very happy to be able to partner with uh, the Spinal Cord Injury Network, uh, Stem Cells Australia, and the Australian Stem Cell Centre to be able to, um, to bring this information and put on these kind of workshops. Uh, so again, I hope it's a, it's a, a positive uh, session and uh, you get an opportunity to ask questions and take away all those um, learnings that you can from the, uh, from the session today. That's probably enough to, uh, from me. I think I'm handing back to, uh, to Stephanie and uh, thank you all for uh, your interest in today's forum. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, so well, good morning and a very warm welcome to Stem Cells, Hope, Hype and Progress. We are absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to partner with the Spinal Injuries Association and share with all of you the excitement of stem cells and indeed some of the rather complex issues that have surrounded their rise to fame. The Spinal Cord Injury Network aims to bring researchers, clinicians and people with spinal cord injury together around promoting recovery from spinal cord injury. If we can improve how we communicate and how we collaborate, we can build capability in this area and ultimately improve treatments for spinal cord injury. So we're here today to learn and talk more about stem cells. And there is no doubt, stem cells have captured the public's imagination. It doesn't matter where I am in the world. If I mention that I work in the area of, of spinal cord injury, the topic of stem cells will come up in the conversation. So why are stem cells so famous or infamous, really? It's really not that long ago that emotions ran high around the ethical debate specifically on embryonic stem cell research. Today, community polling in Australia shows that the public is very supportive of stem cell research, including embryonic stem cell research. And I think it would be fair to say that the debate has moved on to a more scientific one. Will stem cells deliver? Will they live up to the high expectations that have accompanied their rise to fame? When will we be ready to use new stem cell therapies in humans? Burning questions. So stem cells are not the only cells that are being investigated to repair spinal cord injury. Today, we're very lucky to have Professor Alan Mackey Sim from Griffith University. And just delighted he's taken time out of his busy schedule to spend the whole day with us. Now, Alan's team led the world's first clinical trial using olfactory and sheathing cells in spinal cord injury. His team showed that it was both safe and feasible to transplant olfactory and sheathing cells, otherwise neural support cells, from patients into 
their own spinal cords. Now, more work needs to be done to find out you know, if those cells are effective in spinal cord injury. And I think Alan will be probably updating us on his research today. Basically, research into cell-based therapies, like the kind of work that Alan is doing, is at the forefront of promising new treatments. And it makes sense, after all, the spinal cord is made up of cells. So it figures that cells could play a part in fixing spinal cord injuries in the future. Now, in parallel with the publicity surrounding stem cell research, a number of stem cell clinics have sprung up around the world in a number of countries like India, China, and even Germany. And we call it stem cell tourism. So today's workshop aims to open a dialogue around stem cell tourism. We actually know there are quite a significant number of people who are going overseas. We often don't know who they are. We don't know how they're going because they're not being examined before they go and not being followed up when they return. And what we'd like to do today is bring stem cell tourism out into the open without demonising people that do choose to go. Now, like many similar organisations, like the Reeve Foundation, the Rick Hansen Institute, the Spinal Cord Injury Network has a position statement on experimental stem cell interventions overseas. We recognise the great promise of stem cells. However, stem cell research is in its relatively early stages, and there are currently no stem cell therapies that are recommended for people with spinal cord injury. Our message is, quite simply, don't go, because we believe there is not sufficient evidence to show that these treatments are either safe or effective. These clinics are not publishing scientifically peer-reviewed publications of any merit. Reports do rely on testimonials. They're not terribly transparent about the protocols that they use. And so we've also heard a number of complications cases of meningitis, infections, and death. So our advice is, if you are considering taking part in any research trial of any kind, and including these experimental stem cell interventions, you do seek advice from your specialist. From an organizational standpoint, it is important that we do have a clear stance on stem cell tourism, as dogmatic as that may seem. But in my conversations with people who are considering going overseas, I recognise that a position statement at the end of the day doesn't really do much for people with spinal cord injury, hence today's workshop. Today is about opening a dialogue to better understanding the drivers that send people to countries like India and China in search of hope. We're just thrilled to have Professor Alan Mackey Sim here today. I'm also very delighted that Dr. Megan Munsey from Stem Cells Australia can join us today. Actually, both of these guys work with, uh, quite closely with us at the network. Uh, I'd like to thank Megan not only for presenting today, but also uh, in her key role in developing today's workshop. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Megan, who's going to give us a, a Stem Cells 101 presentation, I think. <laughs> um, I, I've known Megan pretty much more as a, an advocate for stem cell research, a, a communicator and an advocate, um, a communicator and an educator, whatever, um, <laughs> all of the above. And um, she is, however, a scientist in her own right and has over 15 years' experience of working in this field. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Megan Munsey. Well, thanks very much, and uh, it's great to be here. I'm a Queenslander, so it's always nice to come back. I live in Melbourne, but it's always nice to come back. Go the Mighty Maroons last night. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you all were able to get here. I'm not celebrating too much the victory. Um, so what I wanted to do was, you know, talk about stem cells. We've heard some even some terms that Steph's used this morning in the introduction. What does it all mean? What's all the fuss? And I want to go right back to basics. And I want to, you know, I want you to, by the end of this short session, I want you to have a few more terms under your belt so you understand a bit more about stem cells. But also, when you see those headlines in the newspaper, dig a bit deeper. Don't be too, you know, don't think that this is a, this is a complex field 
and often it's overly simplified, overly hyped in the newspapers or in, 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 in uh, television articles, television shows. So I want to go right back to basics, right back to what is a cell. So the body is made up of about 200 different types of cells. Those cells have different functions, they look different in the body, they do different things. This photograph is a photograph, and I don't know if you can see that in Townsville, I hope so. Um, this is a photograph of some cells. What all of the cells, all the diff 200 different types of cells have in common is that they have a cytoplasm, which is kind of like the body of the cell, and they have a nucleus, which is like the brain of the cell, and it's shown here in blue in this image. And it's within that nucleus where the DNA resides, the DNA that encodes your genes. And it's the genes that tell the cell what to do. So different cells have different patterns of gene expression. So a heart cell has different genes turned on than a nerve cell. And that manifests in a different morphology, so what the cell looks like and how it acts. So a nerve cell has a, often has a really long body shape with long projections, secreting particular types of proteins at their ends so they can talk to each other. A heart cell has a much more compact morphology where it's really actually hard to see the, 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 between the different cells. It forms a big sheet of cells that kind of work together and beat in unison. So they have a different function. So the different patterns of genes are being expressed. So what's a stem cell? And so really... Exactly. It's a, it's a, a really primitive cell. So it has, it has a different pattern of genes being expressed as well, but it has this kind of more primitive capacity. It's not committed and determined exactly what it's going to become yet. So it sits there in the tissue waiting for signals, exactly what you described, that kind of blueprint, waiting to be told what to do. And occasionally, and it happens, ha happens rarely in, in most of our organs, uh, it will start to push and develop into, it'll divide, and it will retain one cell that's a stem cell, that blueprint cell, and it's one of the daughter cells will start to differentiate or start to grow in a particular direction. So that might be in the heart. A heart cell might make a new a heart stem cell make a new heart cell. But a stem cell has a really primitive fate, and there are lots of different types of stem cells. So the most well-known stem cell is probably the blood stem cell. So in our long in our long bones, we have bone marrow. Within the bone marrow are blood stem cells, hemopoietic stem cells is their kind of fancy name. And those hemopoietic stem cells make red blood cells and make white blood cells. And, and they do that all the time, they're constantly turning over. In fact, a red blood cell only lasts about 120 days. So we need to have those hemopoietic stem cells keep, keep working in the bone marrow. When they don't work, what happens is we get leukemia or anemias, where you have a, a problem with cells of the blood or the immune system. And we've known for actually over 40 years that you can treat those conditions by replacing those stem cells, by doing a bone marrow transplantation or isolating the stem cells from the blood and putting it back in the patient. Often that's accompanied by chemotherapy where basically the, the, those uh, hemopoietic stem cells are killed off in the bone marrow and new ones are put in. So that's a, a great example of cell therapy of cell replacement therapy. Something's faulty, we want to fix it. That's, as Stephanie mentioned, that's about the only example of how we've got it right yet. And what we want to be able to do is mimic what we're doing in bone marrow transplantation in other organs, in spinal cord injury, in MS, in other conditions. But it's not so simple. And what we're doing, what we're spending a lot of time on now is trying to work out how, how can we harness the potential of those cells. So other stem cells, as I mentioned, the, the, the blood or well, bone marrow stem cell is probably the most well-known one, but all of the organs of the body have stem cells in them. And we often call, call them adult stem cells because, you know, they're from the adult. Um, so there's, there's stem cells in your brain, in your heart, in your liver, in your gut, in your skin. If you cut yourself, it's the stem cells in the skin that are replacing uh, the cut. In the gut, we're constantly shedding cells from the lining of the gut. It's the stem cells that are growing over. There's stem cells around parts of the eye that, that you can actually cultivate and get them to grow over the damaged cornea in, uh, in injury. But there's stem cells there. But what we don't know yet is how do we get them? How do we recruit those guys in to get to help? Because we know if you have a heart attack, they don't jump in and, and start repairing that heart tissue. 
often there's a, a scar formed and that then, then, that, that then uh, um, affects the function of the heart. So adult stem cells is the first term that I wanted to kind of throw around today. It's stem cells that reside in the tissue. Those cells are quite rare um, and they usually give rise to the cells from that organ. So a heart stem cell gives rise to a heart cell, um, gut, a, guts, uh, a, a gut cell. Uh, what, uh, what is, I think, really interesting is, is, is whether we can push those cells further. So we're going to come back to that, that point in a little while. But the next term I want to introduce was embryonic stem cells. And Steph mentioned that a moment ago. And um, I think it's really important to show you what a, a photograph of a human embryo looks like. So embryonic stem cells come from an embryo. And up here in the top left-hand corner, we have a very high magnification uh, photo of a human embryo. A human embryo at about seven days after fertilisation, and it's a human embryo made in an IVF clinic. And it's called a blastocyst, this stage of embryo development. And there's about 100 cells. But to give you an idea of how large it is, it's not kind of as big as I've got here, like as big as a basketball. It's actually, it's like a speck of dust in sunlight. It's so tiny, it's just visible to the, to the naked eye. And it's about the size of a, you know, the tip of a pin. And um, these human embryos uh, have um, a particular, they have basically two cell types in them. They have a, they're, they're, the, the blastocyst itself is a hollow sphere and on the outside are cells called the trophectoderm and on the inside, imaginatively, is called the inner cell mass. And if you can see in this photograph, we've got sort of a cluster of tightly packed cells. You can see at about uh, seven o'clock, yeah? And then there's cobblestone cells around the outside. What's important about that morphology, remember I was talking about morphology being different before, in terms of, of ability, those cobblestone cells, the trophectoderm, if that embryo implanted and formed a pregnancy, they would form the placenta. The inner cell mass would form the fetus. And uh, it's the inner cell mass that we collect in the laboratory and make embryonic stem cells from. So the inner cell mass is, is either surgically removed or uh, the cells, those surrounding cells are, 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 are dissolved. And the scientist takes out that inner cell mass, puts it on some support cells and grows them up. Now this is a photograph down on the bottom left of a, a colony or a cluster of human embryonic stem cells. And these cells have been grown from that inner cell mass. It's a couple of weeks after that, at that first um, isolation. And there are now thousands of cells in that colony. Human embryonic stem cells, provided you keep them in the right condition in the, in the laboratory, can be kept in that very primitive blueprint stage. And one of the great attractions about these cells is that you can make them grow into all of the different cells of the body. So you can make them grow into heart, make them grow into nerve, make them grow into liver, if you give them the right signals. And I don't want to oversimplify that because we don't know what all those right signals are yet. We know some of the things that we can kind of trick them into going down those pathways. But we don't know all of it. But it's a really interesting and, and for scientists exciting possibility. Um, human embryonic stem cells were first isolated only 13 years ago in the late 90s and it really, as Stephanie mentioned, captured everybody's imagination, captured the scientific, scientific community's imagination because it felt like we had an endless supply of cells. These cells can be kept in the incubator indefinitely. They can be frozen and stored. Um, so there was great potential there. But with this potential comes some degree of, of, of caution. And uh, one of the gold standards when you're testing these cells and testing their developmental capacity is that you put them in an animal, usually a mouse, um, and you test to see whether they'll form a tumour. Because these cells, you know, back to the fundamental principle, they're called pluripotent, which means they have the capacity to grow into all cell types. So what we do is we take a cluster of these cells, put them back in the mouse, and we form a tumour of all the cell types. And we think that's great because we can show in, in, in the body they've done this. But of course, if we come to a clinical application, you want to be pretty sure that the cells that you're putting back, derived from these guys, are the early nerve cells or are the early heart cells and not some of these undifferentiated early primitive cells because you run a risk of tumour. So that's sort of the first cautionary tale about these cells. Great potential, but some risk. And um, we'll, come, we'll come back that on, uh, on that point later and, and I think Alan will probably talk about it in, some, in terms of some of the clinical translation. 
But in the laboratory, what we can do is grow large numbers of these sort of cells and, and make them go down particular pathways. So pluripotency is this term that we use and, and, and what, what makes us so excited. Four years ago, a Japanese group discovered a new way to make pluripotent stem cells. And uh, they had many of this, these cells called IPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. We love acronyms. Um, and, and induced pluripotent stem cells is, is kind of, as the name implies, they're forced cells to become pluripotent stem cells. And what, what's an, and these cells that they were able to make, these IPS cells they were able to make, have many of the same attributes as embryonic stem cells. So just like I described, you can grow them in large numbers in this undifferentiated state, you can make them go into particular pathways, have the same risk of tumour formation. Um, but you can make them from a skin cell, from a swab in the mouth, from any, from actually any body cell. And it's like a trick. Remember we were talking before about different patterns of genes being expressed. If you take a skin cell and manipulate the genes that are being expressed, actually only add four genes that we know are important in stem cells, add those to the, to the skin cell, you can make these iPS cells. Now it's extremely inefficient, it takes about five weeks to do, but it works. And, and it's a really, I think the next big, big thing in the stem cell field. What does it mean in terms of clinical application? It's too early to know yet. What does it mean against embryonic stem cells? Are they better? Are they, do they replace embryonic stem cells? We don't know yet. It's very, very early days. But what we can see in just this, this short period of time, in four years, is a huge, a huge amount of work that's going on in understanding what's happening, which is great. And that's what we want out of our research, is under, getting greater knowledge about what's going on. And in fact, some groups are now not using, not doing that genetic modification where they're putting in and over-expressing these four genes. They're actually only putting a couple of genes in and then adding a couple of different factors to the growth media. So it might come a time where we can just actually add factors to the growth media and change a cell from a skin cell to a stem cell. And that's something that I would have thought, you know, if somebody said that to me 10 years ago, I would have just laughed and said, no, never be done. So, you know, we have to keep an open mind and we have to keep aware of what's happening in the field. But these are two, two big areas together with the adult stem cells. One thing I didn't mention when I talked about adult stem cells before is I actually hate that term. I prefer tissue stem cells because it comes from a tissue. Because actually adult stem cells can also come from fetal tissue and they can come from cord blood, from a neonate or from a child. So those types of tissue stem cells are all kind of captured in that other third category. So we've got adult stem cells, embryonic stem cells and iPS cells. And these embryonic stem cells and iPS cells have this pluripotent um, capacity. I didn't really talk about um, the, the issues around embryonic stem cells and why they're so contentious. And I just want to touch on that quickly before I, I conclude. And that's this human embryo, where does it come from? And this is uh, this question and, and concern about the exploitation of this technology is what you know, caused a lot of um, anger, I suppose, in the community. Now, we've had legislation in Australia since 2002 that scientists can apply for a licence to use human embryos in research. But the only embryos that they can use in research are those that were originally created for IVF but are now no longer required for the couple. So what happens in IVF is it's not an exact science. We often produce more embryos than you possibly need, not all the time but occasionally. Sometimes we can't produce enough embryos to, to, to help a couple achieve a pregnancy. But occasionally at the completion of, an, of, of their IVF treatment cycle, perhaps at the completion of their family, a couple has this dilemma. They have some embryos frozen in the tank and they have to decide what to do with them. And the options are throw them out, uh, donate them to another couple. But, you know, if you think about it, any child that will result from that embryo, and, of course, not all embryos automatically will form a baby. It's only about a third. But if, if that embryo was donated to another couple and a pregnancy was achieved, that child would be a full sibling to the, 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 the couple's children. So there's quite a lot of social issues there. And of course, since 2002, we've been able to use those embryos in research, provided you can apply, are successful in applying for a licence, and that's not a, a trivial exercise. So um, you can't buy embryos in Australia. You can't make embryos for research um, using sperm and egg fertilisation. So I think in Australia, we've actually got quite the right balance of, of laws versus sort of permissible research. And in fact, today at about 10.30, Minister Butler was supposed to hand down a, a report on our current legislation um, and, and, and endorses the current framework. So we've got um, so the right, I think, the right safeguards. But if people have got some questions around, you know, concerns about IVF and concerns about 
whether it's immoral in, in terms of using embryos in research, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. But anyway, so enough on pluripotent stem cells. What are we actually doing with them? Now, as you can imagine, what we're ultimately interested in is this whole replacement therapy. Can, if we identify the cells that are damaged in a disease or a condition, can we replace them? Can we just say, back, like, like, basically back, back like the, bo the bone marrow analogy I used earlier, those cells are faulty, let's st stick in some new ones. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. We know that works in bone marrow. We actually don't even, we can't even make sure that works in every example of a bone marrow transplantation when it's needed. Um, so there's still even a lot to learn in the bone marrow field to treat people with leukemias and, and anemias. But um, what we do know is that, that we, we, we have some really interesting animal data that shows that, that certain stem cells can replace faulty cells in the animal. There is some work being done in terms of of trying out, having learnt from animal studies, starting to try out those approaches in, in patients. And the stem cells we're using are a lot of different types of stem cells. We're using cord stem cells. We're using um, uh, Allen's uh, nasal derived cells. We're using um, embryonic stem cells just to test out first whether it's safe and, and, and whether it can then uh, repair the injury. So this sort of photograph here, a little vial, is what we'd all like to see one day, that we have in the at the hospital a vial of cells that for condition X you pick up you know, the vial and you add it. And that will stop the progression of the disease or, or in response to an acute injury, it will treat the condition. But we're quite a long way away from, from doing that in all reality. It's a very simplistic argument to think that we can just do replace. We don't know yet how many cells to put back, what, si what type of cells. So when, when, cells start to, when stem cells start to grow toward a, a, and make a new mature cell, like a liver cell, there's lots of steps in the process. So which type of cells do we want to go back? Because ultimately we want cells that go back and stick in there and have that kind of stem cell property where they'll keep making replacement cells. Otherwise, we'll just have to keep coming back for more and more transplants every time the cells exhaust themselves. So we want to be able to do that, but we're a while, a while away. What we're actually doing in the lab right now is kind of like the top left photo. We're in the lab, we're using these cells, we're looking at them, we're comparing them, we're saying what happens if we manipulate them in this way what, and we add these factors, what happens? And it may well be that the information we learn about that differentiation pathway, how to add the factors and control the cell's development, might mean we don't need cell therapy. It might mean we actually get a new drug that we can add to recruit the endogenous stem cells, the cells that are already in the body. So when somebody has a heart attack, you add the factor that will recruit the endogenous stem cells to repair that injury or suppress the scar formation. So it's knowledge that we're gaining at the moment and we're at every opportunity looking to apply that in a clinical context, but it's going to happen in different avenues and different, in different conditions at different rates because of the complexity of different conditions. The final point I want to make is that we're already using these cells, at, at different types of stem cells, in the laboratory to screen for new drugs. iPS cells, the cells I told you about before, we can take a cell from a, a, a patient um, and, and make stem cells. That provides us with a really unique opportunity to take cells that from, are from a patient with a particular disease and study that disease in the laboratory and add different and the opportunity to add different drugs and different reagents to see whether it stops the progression of those of, of that disease. Finally, um, in in, tox, in in drug development, there's a stage where a lot of drugs are actually discarded uh, as a, as a therapeutic because it's seen to have toxic effects to the liver, for example, or affect the heart, and the, and the drug and the drug development is actually abandoned which is a lot of a waste of resources and, and, and time and effort as well. So what, what stem cells can offer is sort of like a, another phase in the development pathway where you can make heart cells from stem cells, grow them in the laboratory and test the reagents on those cells to see whether this, it affects how the heart cell functions. So this sort of drug screening is another idea. So we're doing basic research, we're using cells for drug screening and development and we're ultimately working towards clinical application. So. I hope that's given you a, a flavour for stem cells and why we're excited about them, but also a couple of different points to think about in terms of, of the unknowns, what we don't know yet. And I'm happy to take questions if we've got time, Steph. Um, I'm here today as a person experiencing the late effects of polio 
and I don't know if you're familiar with what happens when you have polio, but it basically decimates your finite stock of motor neurons. And I'm very interested in the possibility of replacing that stock via stem cell therapy. Has your organisation ever looked at that aspect of it? So, so uh, in terms of motor neurone development, no, no one that we're funding at the moment is specifically looking at that. But of course, there are groups uh, around the world. And um, I'm familiar with some studies where, particularly in ALS, in, in, in other neurodegenerative condition, where they're actually using that iPS cell analogy to say, to, to screen for compounds. To, well, firstly, to grow stem cells from different different patients to look at how they develop, but then to start to screen for for, for um, drugs that might prevent the progression of the, the condition, so to stop the symptoms. But of course, cell therapy, so replacement would be another opportunity. But at the moment, I think we're, we're concentrating more on whether initially we can stop the progression. Delivery of the cells, as you can imagine, is, is a great challenge in, in that condition. Did you want to say anything else, Alan, about that? Maybe. Um, yeah, the most of the research is on um, uh, traumatic spinal cord injury, and um, there's a little bit of work trying to put in in animals. I'm saying where people are using stem cells to make new motor neurons. Their cell body is in the spinal cord here, and they have this projection, this connection down to the muscles. Um, but as Megan said, it's a, such a challenge to um, to get the right cells in the right place, connecting with the right muscles. So, but as far as I know, there's nobody working on polio specifically. I just see it as a growth industry because there are still countries around the world where polio is endemic, and you know, thirty to forty years after the acute phase of polio there will be pop massive populations experiencing the late effects for whom stem cell therapy could uh, reduce their, their symptoms um, significantly. Polio is not a degenerative disease um, in respect of something actually going wrong with the neurons you have left. It's a disease of... Um, um, the cells that you have left, the motor neurons that you have left, they're not ill or sick um, or diseased, they're just dying of exhaustion. So it's just a, it's just a plain um, a theory of just replacing the population with new workers. And do you need a guinea pig? Well, I wish I wish I did, <laughs> but I'll I'll um, I'll see if I can find out some some more about what's happening overseas in, in that area in, in terms of polio. Yeah, hi. Um, my two questions are probably a part of the hype of the stem cell thing. I've watched on TV and YouTube about the spinal cord repair or the successful spinal cord repair in a mouse. Um, so that's, if you could fill me in a little bit on that. And then the second one was maybe six months ago, there was some stuff in the news about the first clinical trial on a terminally ill patient in the US um, trialling uh, stem cell therapy and I've never heard any results on that and can't find any results on that so I was just wondering if you knew. Um, I'll be talking in my section I'll be talking about um, clinical trials and those issues so maybe clinical questions uh, we could we could delay the discussion till then but in, in answer to the question um, there, there are a lot of uh, animal experiments where a spinal cord injury has been uh, improved in animals um, there's a multitude of different uh, cell treatments that have been shown to improve in mice or rats. Uh, but um, for reasons that you'll discover in my talk, uh, uh, many of them have not been gone any further than that. As for um, a clinical trial in, a, in um, a terminally ill person on spinal cord injury, I've not heard Yeah, I, there's, you know, there's uh, the the media picks up on all sorts of things, and often um, they might be a, a trial by a clinician doing one patient. It's not really a clinical trial, but somehow it gets into the press. Um, I'm not aware of that one in particular. 
I think um, there's an example recently, uh, you might have seen it in the paper, it's got a lot of attention. It's a small one, one doctor in Canberra treating, has treated two patients who had a very aggressive form of MS and, and he treated them with stem cells. And of course, as soon as I heard that, I thought, well, they, they've replaced the, the, the cells that are faulty in, in MS and that must be what he's doing and gosh, how's that working? But actually when I, when I looked into it a bit more, he was using bone marrow transplantation to basically killing off the patient's um, blood system with their, in their bone marrow and then using donate or the, the patient's cells to reset their immune system and that was interfering with the progression of the disease. So he was only able to do this because the patients were terminal and they were going to pass away very quickly and it was very aggressive, they were very young. But, and this is not novel, a lot of other clinics are, are, are trying this. In fact, there's a clinical trial in the States at the moment for this acute uh, or aggressive MS. But it comes with risk. Uh, chemothera this aggressive form of chemotherapy causes death in itself. So, um, again, not, not so simple. And I, I just sort of reiterate Alan's comment about the walking, uh, the, it, it, there's a lot of rat videos and, you know, extremely compelling. But, gee, we need to know what the injury was, when were the cells delivered and, and, and whether it truly represents what happens in, in, in uh, a, a spinal cord injury in humans. Sorry, there's also another one that's on YouTube. It's a CNN article where some bloke, after 19 years of spinal cord injury, in Austin, Texas, had stem cell treatment of some kind, clinically trialled. There was four patients and he was successful and he was up and walking with, you know, walking sticks. And there was some other lady who missed out on the clinical trials and she was quite upset that this trial wasn't going to be, like, more patients. And again, uh, you know, just asking if, I guess it would come back to your talk when it comes to uh, things like that. But I was just, yeah, I thought I'd... Jump in early. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the reasons I came along to this talk about stem cell, I've got a problem with cancer. I've been fighting for about eight years now. Um, I've got uh, prostate cancer, which has caused uh, two lots of bone cancer in the spine. Um, they've never found the... Um, they've never found the... Um, Oh, I forgot the word. Um, anyway, they they don't know where I'm sourcing the cancers from, and um, I was wondering would the stem cell somewhere down the track would control various cancers. So, the, so this idea of of cancer and stem cells is a really interesting idea, and and, and what happens. The hypothesis or the idea is what, what could happen in some cells, some, a, a, a body stem cell, is that the, the DNA gets corrupted and, and that's the, the origin of the cancer. And we're not sure whether that's the case in all the, the this is theory of stem cell cause in cancer. You know, it, it's maybe not clear in all stem cells, but there's actually a, a woman um, in Melbourne, uh, Jane Visveda and her group at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, We've actually shown that in a particular type of breast cancer, there's a, 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 a type of, of stem cell that's faulty. And why that's important is that they can divide up what type of cancer it is and also, again, what drugs might be able to target that particular type of cancer. So I think, again, that's sort of an example of what I was trying to talk about before with drug discovery is that's what stem cells might teach us. So not to cure the cancer per se, but using stem cells identify a new way of treating a cancer. So I hope that is, is helpful. 